Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Diogenes of Sinope is a very important figure within the development early on of the Cynic school. We don't really know, although people have different theories about this, whether he was a student of Antisthenes or whether that's a, a you know, later constructed story or whether he was uh, the first Cynic. We, we don't really know and there's some controversy. We don't have to worry too much about that at this point. But we do know that he is one of the characters in the development of what became a very influential school who was looked to as a prime example. And a lot of people wrote about him, including Diogenes Laertes. And within Diogenes Laertes, there's a uh, discussion among the many things that he attributes to Diogenes where Diogenes is asked what is the most beautiful or the best thing in in the world or for for human beings uh kali stone which means the beautiful the fine the noble and what does he say paresia and paresia is something that we translate as alternately freedom of speech or frankness of speech. And both of those are decent translations. They kind of cover different aspects of this. So freedom of speech, we typically associate with being able to like speak your mind and, you know, communicate what it is that you want to without necessarily being censored or encountering reprisals. In terms of a human being, paresia isn't just a lack of constraints. It's the person's ability to say their mind. They, they, cause you could have all sorts of thoughts, but you never actually say them because you're too shy or too afraid or something like that. Frankness is another nice term because who are we frank with? We're frank with people who we think are in some respect deserving of the truth whether the truth be something painful to them, as it very often is in the case of Diogenes and his interlocutors, or whether it's truth that they really ought to have, they have a right to, because they're screwing their life up. Oftentimes these go hand in hand, right? If you're screwing your life up, you don't like to have other people tell you that. But this frankness of speech is, is very important. And Diogenes exemplifies this in the ancient period among a lot of other people who do speak their mind. And it takes a number of different forms that I want to call your attention to before we go a little bit deeper into, well, why is he doing this? Um, he, he's said to have poured scorn on others. And, you know, scorn is when you're criticizing and you're doing so not in a sort of constructive way, but, you know, you're making fun of them. Uh, Plato was, you know, a prime target, apparently, of Diogenes, but he wasn't the only target. So there's this great passage. He was great at pouring scorn on his contemporaries, the school of Euclides, which is the Megarian school. He called Bilius. Plato's lectures, a waste of time, the performances at the Dionysia, great peep shows for fools. Now that's theater, right? And the demagogues, the mobs, lackeys. He used to also say when he saw physicians, philosophers, and pilots at their work, now philosophers in the genuine sense for him, 
He deemed man the most intelligent of all animals when he saw interpreters of dreams and diviners and those who attended to them or those who were puffed up with the conceit of wealth. He thought no animal more silly. He would continually say for the conduct of life, we need right reason or a halter. So he's, he's an equal opportunity offender, as we typically say. And then, you know, there's some stories about him and Plato. Observing Plato at, a, at one day at a costly banquet taking olives, and he says... How is it that you, you the philosopher who sailed to Sicily for the sake of these dishes, now when they're before you, do not enjoy them? And then Plato says, Nay, by the gods, Diogenes, there also for the most part I lived on olives and the like. And then Diogenes says, Well, why then did you have to go to Syracuse? Was it Attica at the time did not grow olives? And so he's, he's ribbing him. He's kind of joking with him. There's another great story of him walking into Plato's academy when Plato had to find, um, the human being is a featherless biped. He plucks a chicken and throws it in and says, there's a man for you, Plato. So he's, he's constantly uh, going after Plato. Uh, but he, he goes after all sorts of others as well. There's lots of interesting put-downs, criticisms, jokes at people's expenses. Let's just look at a few of these to give you a, sort of a sense. So um, in... in uh, one uh, great case, here we go, Lysias the druggist asked him if he believed in the gods. So he's asking him, uh, do, you, do you think the gods exist or not? And, he, and so Diogenes says, how can I help believing in them when I see a God forsaken wretch like you? So, you know, obviously, if, if somebody's God forsaken, the gods must exist. Terrible argument, but a great joke at the time. And it uh, you know, conveys something about the guy's character that Diogenes is targeting. Here's another great one. Once he saw the officials of a temple leading away someone who had stolen a bowl belonging to the treasurers and said, the great thieves are leading away the little thief. You know, so that's, you know, a nice little put down right there. Uh, in that same section, he says, when some boys clustered around him and said, take care, he doesn't bite us, he says, never fear, boys, a dog doesn't eat beetroot. And, he, and that comes up at another point as well. What does he mean there? I, I'm, I'm a dog. I'm a cynic, kunos, right? But dogs don't eat crap. Dogs don't eat the sort of things that you namby-pamby, not nobodies would actually be. You're kind of below me. So he's using the occasion to say something. Um, let's look at another example here. He says that an ignorant rich man he used to call the sheep with the golden fleece, uh, seeing a notice on the house of a prolificate to be sold, he said, I knew well that after such surfeiting, you would throw up the owner, meaning you ate too much, the house, and now he's going to puke up the, the owner. To a young man who complained of the number of people who annoyed him by their attentions, he said, well, don't hang out, sign an invitation. And then a public bath, which was dirty, people would go and bathe, you know, together. He said, when people have bathed there, where are they going to go and, and get clean? So, you know, he's got like a, a witticism for all these different occasions. They're not necessarily with any great philosophical content, um, but, you know, they, they do show some of his ideas about a, a few things uh, and what matters in life. Um, a little bit later, here's another set of things. He says, um, observing a fool uh, tuning a psaltery, a uh, harp, right? Are you not ashamed to give this wood concordant sounds while you fail to harmonize your soul with life? Okay, now there, what we're seeing is something that we're going to talk about, mistaken priorities that he's signaling. Um, he says, uh, uh, to one who protested, he was ill-adapted for the study of philosophy. And he says, well, why do you live then if you don't care to live well? And so, again, you know, talking about priorities. Um, another thing that he does that's quite interesting, Diogenes lived in a very simple way. And he was good with begging for or having people giving him food, clothing. There's a story about him receiving a cloak and then not giving it back and saying, listen, if it was a gift, then I'm going to keep it. If it was a loan, I'm still using it. Uh, but food is another thing. And there, there's a couple interesting little uh, quips about that. So he says, being short of money, 
He told his friends, he applied to them, not for alms, but for repayment of his due. What does that mean? They owe him. What do they owe him for? The, the wonderful company that he gives? No, for teaching them, for helping them in, in a certain way. Um, a little bit later in Diogenes Laertes, he says of Diogenes the cynic, um, here we go, uh, he begged alms of a statue and when asked why he did to practice in being refused, right? So that's an interesting practice. In asking alms, as he did at first by reason of his poverty, he used this form. If you have already given to anyone else, give to me also. If not, begin with me. And so he's providing, you could say, a short argument, a justification for why Somebody ought to feed him out of their surplus. <coughs> He's also very famous for his responses to Alexander the Great. And as a matter of fact, outside of <coughs> Diogenes Laertes, there are some texts that are supposedly recording conversations Diogenes is having with Alexander at greater length. Alexander of Macedon, later Alexander the Great, uh, the conqueror of, of the Persian Empire, so the first one I think many people are quite familiar with. Um, when Alexander uh, shows up, um, he's uh, asked, you know, Diogenes, uh, Alexander asks him, do you need anything? And he says, yes, uh, stand out of my light. And there's a lot of different interesting twists on this one that we can, we can talk about in other places. Um, another one that happens that's quite famous as well. Here we go. Um, yeah, doo -doo -doo. He is um, encountering uh, Alexander. Here we go. Alexander once came and stood opposite him and said, I am Alexander the great king, Megas Basileus, right? So this is like, you know, I'm, I'm on top of the world. And Diogenes responds, and I am Diogenes the cynic. And so you say, well, what's that about? Well, each of them is like putting their titles out there. And Diogenes is in a certain way either placing himself on the same level or saying, listen, buddy, we're all down here, even though you're the great king. There's one other discussion of Diogenes and Alexander as well. He says, when Alexander stood opposite him and asked, are you not afraid of me? Now, why would Diogenes be afraid of him? Well, because Alexander had the power basically to put anybody to, to death or to do anything he wanted, right? He's, he's the great king. Um, he says, are you not afraid of me? And Diogenes says, well, why? What are you? Are you a good thing or a bad thing? And Alexander says, a good thing. And so Diogenes says, well, who then is afraid of the good? You know, and the idea there is he's kind of, he's kind of ribbing him a bit, right? If you really are a good thing, why would I be scared of you? Um, are you really a good thing, Alexander? Right? There's also some really interesting responses where he's justifying his mode of living as a cynic. And so let's, let's actually work backwards in the text with these. So, um, he says, uh, he saw no impropriety either in stealing anything from a temple or eating the flesh of any animal, nor anything impious in touching human flesh. This, he said, being clear from the custom of some foreign nations. So, you know, there's nothing that's really off limits except by custom that we happen to have. And, you know, other, other nations do these sorts of things, so that, that's all right. Um, here's another example, being reproached for drinking in a tavern. He says, I also get my hair cut in a barber shop. And so the, the, the idea there is, well, there's certain places where, why would you complain about me doing that? It'd be similar if you went to a brothel and somebody's like, you're, you know, consorting with the prostitutes. Well, what do you think a brothel's for? You know, that's the whole point of, of that sort of thing. He didn't go to brothels, uh, typically. So, um, being reproached for eating in the marketplace, he says, well, it was in the marketplace that I felt hungry. 
So within the marketplace, this is where I'm going to satisfy my hunger. There's also another very famous uh, example of him masturbating in the marketplace and then saying, if it was only so easy to satisfy hunger by rubbing your belly, um, right? And that's, that's another justification of his behavior. Instead of saying, well, this is where I actually feel this, he's saying, wouldn't it be nice if things worked this way? Um, another great one is somebody reproached him for his exile. Okay, so why would they make fun of him for that? Being exiled was viewed as a bad thing. Diogenes says, this is actually a great thing for me. By being exiled, I discovered philosophy. By philosophy, he doesn't just mean, you know, books about philosophy. He means encountering somebody who could teach him a way of life. And then he says, uh, when somebody reminded him the people of Sinope had sentenced him to exile for, you know, defacing the currency, he says, I them to homestaying. Um, another example is provided. Um, yeah, the uh, marketplace idea, right? Uh, masturbating in the marketplace. We've already discussed that one. And so he gives a lot of, he uses his freedom of speech to justify his freedom of action. He also criticizes others about their values and their priorities as being mistaken, a theme we've brought up already. And this is uh, quite important. The cynic is viewed not just as somebody who's a nonconformist, but somebody whose nonconformity consists in showing another possible way of life. So here's an example. One day he was, was discoursing very seriously. Nobody paid attention to him. He began whistling and then people clustered about him and he reproached them. He says, why are you coming to listen to nonsense and not paying attention to serious discourse? What is wrong with you? Why don't you think about that? And he doesn't spell it out completely. Uh, maybe maybe he did in a serious discourse that we don't really know uh, because we don't have the full record of it, just a, a saying. Um, he's got another great one at Megara where he saw the sheep protected by leather jackets and the children went bare. He said, it's better to be a Megarian's ram than his son. So he's saying, you take better care of your sheep than you do your children Again, what's wrong with you is the implication there. What's wrong about your priorities or your values? Another prime example, um, this is a great one, although you, know, you need to know a little bit of cultural background to make this one work. Being asked by a tyrant what bronze is best for a statue, he replied, that of which Harmodius and Aristogiton were molded. Now, what does that mean? Well, those were tyrant killers. So if you're going to make a statue for you, the tyrant, why don't you make it out of the stuff that was used to make statues for these guys or what it was that they were composed of? And maybe somebody will kill you too, you tyrant, you no good person. Um, another good example. Uh, here we go. To a man who is urgently pressing his suit to a courtesan. He's, he's, this is sort of a higher class prostitute, what we would nowadays call like an escort or something. Why are you at such pains to gain your suit when it would be better for you to actually lose it? So why are you pursuing this, this person and spending so much time, so much money, so much attention on it when you'd actually be better off using that on other things, and that would happen if you actually did lose your suit. So that's, that's a key example. He also had some you know, positive teachings, and these are another example of paresia. Um, he's got a, there's a long discussion here about the need for discipline, ascasis in Greek. He says, training was of two kinds, mentally and bodily, the latter being that whereby, with constant exercise, Perceptions are formed such as secure freedom of movement for virtuous deeds. The other half of this training is incomplete without the other. Good health and strength being just as much included among the essential things, whether for body or soul. And so he's, he's saying that, you know, this is how we arrive at virtue. He's using his capacity to teach to tell us how we ought to behave. 
And then he says, um, nothing in life has any chance of succeeding without strenuous practice. This is capable of overcoming anything. And instead of useless efforts or toils, people should choose such as nature recommends, whereby they might have lived happily. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot more to this, this conversation, uh, which you can find. But he's, he's teaching, you know, some, some ideas, and he's doing so in kind of a public way. This may have been one of the things where he's um, telling people, you need to attend to my serious lectures. Um, another thing that's really quite interesting is he's taken as a slave. And this is very common in the ancient world. Um, there were a lot of ways to become a slave. And as a slave, he tells people when, when you know, everybody's uh, supposed to instruct, the, you know, what, what am I good for? Well, I can wash dishes. I can be a gardener. He says, I'm the person who's ready to rule men. So buy me as a slave if you want a master. So this is... Parasia, this is being in a very difficult situation and saying something that could, you know, resound with the people that are there. So it says, um, yeah, he says, anybody should, should buy me if they want to purchase a master to them for, for themselves. Um, Zeniades purchased him and he said, you must obey me, although I am a slave. Why? If a physician or a steerman were in slavery, he would be obeyed. What, what is he saying there? He's saying, you need to obey me for your own good, for your own safety. That's why you've, in essence, hired me. And he, there's a discussion here about what he teaches the sons of Xeniades. And it's quite a curriculum. Uh, very interesting thing uh, discussed in this. A little bit later in um, the, the work, he says uh, to Zeniades who purchased him, he said, come, see that you obey orders, right? Um, when, he, when he quoted the line, backward the streams flow to their fonts, Diogenes asked, if you had been ill and had purchased a doctor, would you then, instead of obeying him, have said that? Um, so, you know, that's, that's the idea there that, that he's using free speech once again to say, you need to listen to me. I'm a philosopher and philosophy can help you understand your life. The last thing that I think we should close on is his criticisms of something that's kind of the opposite of freedom of speech. So in freedom of speech or frankness of speech, you get to tell people how things are, or at least how you think they are, and you get to do so for their own good. And what's the opposite of that? Well, what he calls, um, or what the Greeks called flattery and being a psychophant, um, you know, where you're, you're essentially telling people lies about themselves or about where they fit in or whether they're good people or, or not in order to get something out of them. So he's asked, what creature's bite is the worst? He says, of those that are wild, a psychophant, of those who are tame, a flatterers. And then he says, ingratiating speech he compared to honey used to choke you, right? So he's contrasting this to the social conventions of speaking at the time, which have people telling each other pleasant lies just to get by, what we often call white lies. And he's saying, no, I'm not going to be like that. The, my way of life demands that we call a spade a spade, that we call a psychophant a psychophant, that we tell people you've got your priorities all screwed up. And we use speech for the means of producing a better, more virtuous life.